Okay. okay. Welcome everybody to our new class in this new series of understanding the reform faith. Very glad that you could join us and hopefully others can join as we go on. Um, let me first draw your attention to what we're going to cover in the class. As I've said in the newsletter, some of you are very familiar with the Reformed faith, some of you are new to the Reformed faith, um, some have, have studied, some have not, and you're familiar with certain terms, but I hope to have more of an in-depth study as we, we work our way through uh, this series. So these are some of the things that we're going to cover. Today we're going to cover Sola Scriptura because that's a Essential, that's a foundation for everything else we're going to say. Next week, we're not meeting here. We're meeting in the music room where the youth meet uh, for our congregational meeting. Okay? And then we're going to continue. We're going to look at before worship, the sovereignty of God, which is foundational, the other solas of the Reformation, covenant theology, which uh, really was born out of the Reformed tradition. The offices of Jesus, prophet, priest, and king. We're going to take a look at the Reformed view of the Christian life, which is distinctive from other traditions. And then we're going to move into the five points of Calvinism. When people think of Reformed faith or Reformed theology, <coughs> just think of the five points of Calvinism. But there's much more to it. So we're going to do a little bit of an introduction to historical development of how we got there to the sin of glory, and then go through each one. And as you see, we're taking a break during Easter. So um, I, I welcome questions. Um, let's see how it goes this morning, because I'm used to, to talking longer than 45 <laughs> minutes in Sunday school. But uh, we're, we'll see how we get through uh, the material. And uh, you, you have that before you as something to look back on. But let's go ahead and pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, the good deposit of, of your word and uh, that we have this that has been passed down from century to century, that we have a Bible in our hands in our own language that is a blessing that we take for granted. Uh, there are many Christians in the world who do not have that privilege, but we thank you that you have taught us, that you have disclosed yourself to us and all the wonderful truths about your grace towards us in the Lord Jesus. And we ask that you would not only inform us and teach us, but that you would shape us and give us a zeal for yourself, zeal for the gospel, zeal for the kingdom. Pray for your superintendents by the Holy Spirit this morning. Thank you for all my brothers and sisters here. Pray that they would be encouraged in Jesus' name. Okay, well, to follow along in your handout. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, this morning about some of the historical um, origins of this doctrine. Sola Scriptura is just the Latin for Scripture alone. Now, you may have heard that there were two causes, they're, they're called the material cause and the formal cause of the Reformation. And so the material cause, as you think of something, what is it made out of? What's the substance of it? And the material cause of the Reformation, the doctrine out of which the Reformation was made, is the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That was the pivotal issue. The formal cause of the Reformation, in terms of the form, the structure, the direction out, out of which the Reformation came, was the doctrine of the authority of Scripture alone. We would not even know that the doctrine of justification is precious and true without Scripture. So the doctrine of Sola Scriptura is foundational for everything else we're going to say. The reformers didn't actually use that term, though they, they spoke to the principle of it, but that term was actually applied a little bit later, but it's nonetheless descriptive of what the reformers were promoting at that time. From the beginning of the church, the church has always had a high view of scripture, and even the Catholic church has a very high view of scripture. They also have a very high view of tradition, 
And as we're going to see, that poses a, a problem in, in how we, we view scripture. But I do want to focus more on the, the Presbyterian Reformed uh, view. And as we get into this, the issue at the heart of this particular matter is one of authority. Where do you look to, to hear God's voice? Where do you look to understand who God is, what, what the gospel entails, and so forth? And so we are going to compare the Catholic and Protestant view because this was basically fundamental to what was going on during the Reformation out of which this particular doctrine arose. So at that time, even before the Reformation, even though the Catholic Church had a high view of scripture, over time, various man-made traditions and superstitions crept into the church. So for most of the Middle Ages, uh, the Word of God was basically hidden from the mind of common man. The, the Mass was in Latin, it was not in the vernacular. People would go and they would listen and not understand what was even being said, but they were there in obedience to God and something magical was happening up there, and uh, then they leave. So it was very unfortunate that the people didn't know even the Word of God. With the Reformation, wonderful things happen as people get the copies of Scripture into their own language and hear the Word of God in their own tongue. So the Roman Catholic view basically says that Scripture and church, church tradition are infallible. And the church does not permit anyone to have a different interpretation outside of what the church determines. When we talk about the leadership of the Catholic Church, we took, it's called the magisterium. Whatever the magisterium says, all the, the cardinals and the pope, or whatever they say, that, that is on par with scripture. And in one sense, it's, you might say it's, it's even kind of above scripture because it's how they interpret scripture. Theirs is the only correct interpretation. Your interpretation is of no account. It's only what the church says. Now, the Protestant view, obviously, is very, very different because we believe that the Old and New Testament are inspired by God. Only sufficient rule for faith and practice. And because they're given by God, they have intrinsic authority. And you will find in Scripture, in Deuteronomy, in Proverbs, and other places, that we are not to add or subtract from the Word of God. And uh, in Proverbs 30, it talks about that anyone who adds to the Word of God will be proved a liar. So you can imagine, as the Reformers were reading the, the Bible, and saying, something doesn't match up here, because the church is saying one thing, I don't find that, which purgatory in the Scripture, I don't see that any place. So we are not to add to the Word of God or to subtract from it. And this is no small question because what authority do you trust for your eternal salvation? You're going to listen to the church and defer to the church and say, well, whatever the priest says, that's, that's it. That's how I grew up, by the way. It was basically whatever the priest says, that, that's how it is. And we were not encouraged to read the Bible. Um, now, what happens? There, there is a debate surrounding Martin Luther, which we'll get to in a moment. Sola Scriptura was, was at the center of, of what was occurring during the Reformation, but there were precursors to Martin Luther. So, obviously, Martin Luther is, in one sense, the, the, the father of the Reformation. He's the one who really got things going. Uh, Zwingli was close and in time. Uh, in terms of what he was doing in Zurich. But let's talk about some historical precursors. There's a, name, a man by the name of Peter Waldo. This is in the 12th century. He was a rich merchant in Lyon, France. And he asked a bunch of monks to translate the scripture into the vernacular, into French, whatever French looked like at that time. 
And so he is credited with um, helping the Bible to be translated into a, mo a modern tongue in Europe besides Latin. He was the first to do that. And so as he studied the scriptures, he started to de deny purgatory and indulgences and question the church, and obviously that caused a, a stir. But he thought it was very important to look at scripture primarily. Then you have John Wycliffe, who is a professor at Oxford, theologian, philosopher, linguist, and he, as he studies the scripture, he says, well, this should be for the common people. We should have this translated. And he translated the New Testament into English. Probably his associates, associates translated it, the Old Testament. So there is a, such a thing called as the Wycliffe Bible. So that's the first English translation. Like Peter Waldo, um, Wycliffe questioned some things about the church in terms of indulgences and the, the papacy and purgatory. It's very interesting. Waldo, Wycliffe, and Huss all believe that the church, uh, the true church, is made up of the predestined. That was something they all agreed, agreed upon, and they all began to question the, the dictates and the, the authority that was given to the papacy and the church, saying, you know, there's, there's things inconsistent with what you're teaching and what the Bible's teaching. We're going to defer to Scripture. Then you have Jan Hus, who was greatly influenced by uh, Wycliffe, and he was a rector at the University of Prague. Uh, by the way, Wycliffe is called the Morning Star of the Reformation because it's almost like the, the, the dawn of the Reformation. Before the Reformation is it fully uh, a movement, you have Wycliffe encouraging you this. By the way, you know what they did? <laughs> the, the Catholics hated Wycliffe so much. Later on, they condemned him, dug up his bones and burned them, just to say, yeah, as if that would do yeah. anything. <laughs> Um, <laughs> John Huss, uh, again, also questioned things in the church, uh, pointing to the priority and primacy of Scripture. Now, what happens with Huss, real quick, is that, that he is uh, questioned. There's a council, Council of Constance, and they say, listen, we'll, we'll, Promise your safety if you come and talk to us about these things, and we'll work out our differences. As soon as he gets there, they arrest him, throw him in prison, and later he's burned at the stake. But Huss says something almost prophetic. He says, you can silence this goose. Huss means is goose. And I'm hearing. You can... Silence this goose, but after me will, will come a swan you will not be able to silence. And then people attribute that to Martin Luther about a uh, hundred years later, which is, and there's another story behind that for another day. But uh, Luther and the other reformers said, listen, our conscience is bound by the word of God. And when Luther comes before the Diet of Worms, before Charles V and others, they ask him to recant what he's written. All of his writings are there. He asks to, that he would have a, a night to pray about it. And he comes back, and then these famous words, unless I am convinced by sacred scripture or by evident reason, I will not recant my conscience is held captive by the word of God, and to act against conscience is neither right nor safe. Um, Luther is then uh, leaves, kidnapped by his friends, and taken to a castle where he translates the, the Bible into German. You see, all the reformers had this idea that it was important for the common people to understand the word of God. So you have to translate it into the vernacular. Now, the next quote here, my professor at RTS, uh, I, don't, I cannot find a source, but this is what he said, that 
Calvin and Luther never met each other. Calvin respected Luther immensely. Actually, at one point, calls him an apostle. Not on the same level as the original apostle, but he respected him uh, so much. But Luther says, the word creates the church, not vice versa. And this is what apparently he wrote to Calvin. It is not the word of God because the church says so, but that the word of God might be spoken, therefore the church comes into being. The church does not make the word, but is made by the word. Very important, because the Catholic Church said, we determine what the scripture is through the various councils, and then we're the grand interpreters of scripture, so you don't have the the knowledge or the exp expertise or the anointing of the spirit to determine that for yourself. You have to look to us. What a hold they had on the, the people there. So these are Rome's claims that the complete rule of faith and practice consists of scripture and tradition. What tradition? The oral tradition. They speak of an oral tradition that was passed down from Peter and the other apostles along the way. And they say, where is this oral tradition? Well, I don't know where it is, but they think they know what it is. And through all of their councils and declarations and the Pope speaking ex cathedra, which means from the chair, from the place of authority, whatever he says is infallible. So that is equal to scripture in their view. Now, uh, just an uh, important clarification, because sometimes when we talk about sola scriptura, Protestants think all we need is God's word, and we don't need anything else. There's a difference between tradition with a capital T and tradition with a small t. So... Do we have anything else in the church that serves as some sort of authority? Confession. Our confession, absolutely. That serves as an authority in our church. It's a subordinate authority, but it's still an authority. We look to the early creeds as authoritative, as a summary of the Christian faith, and so on. So tradition can either be positive or negative. And um, let, me, let me read to you from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. This is what Paul says. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by letter. He uses tradition. That's apostolic tradition. That's different. And then listen to what Jesus says to the Pharisees, which really could apply to Rome, in Mark 7. You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. So, again, tradition can be positive or it can be negative. Um, we respect the, the people who came before us. The reformers looked to the early church fathers, especially Augustine, as an authority, but not equal in authority to Scripture. Everything has to be subject and compared to uh, Scripture. So, um, again, the tradition for Rome, uh, it's uh, necessary to teach additional truth not contained in the scriptures and to interpret the scriptures. And I'll just give you an example of how the tradition develops over time. So, whatever you know about the Catholic Church, it, it didn't, uh, in all their declarations and beliefs were not solidified in the first or second century, they developed over time. For instance, the Doctrine of Mary, I'll just say, uh, include some of this. So, perpetual virginity of Mary. When was that uh, codified? The, the Latin Council of 1649. 
the Immaculate Conception of Mary. When was that codified? In 1854. The Assumption of Mary, body and soul, into heaven. When was that declared? 1950. So you see, over time, you know, they, they add things because of the Pope and the Cardinal saying, oh, what do you think about this? Hey, why don't we add that one? Uh, the church is the infallible interpreter of the rule of faith. She claims authority was given to her by Peter and transmitted through a whole line of popes. So they point to Matthew 16, and this goes back to the issue of authority. And so I'll just go through this quickly. This is how they interpret Matthew 16. Christian church is squarely built on Peter because Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church. And they say that that is Peter, not his confession of faith. They claim that Peter is the first bishop of the church in Rome. Uh, then they say Peter passed down the keys of the kingdom to his successors in Rome, and therefore the Catholic Church is a true church founded by Jesus Christ. Just for your information, it wasn't until the 5th or 6th century that someone claimed authority over the other bishops. So in the early church, over time, well, the early church had bishops, they had Elders, they had deacons. There were patri, patri oh, okay, that's a tongue twister. Uh, <laughs> patriarchal bishops in five cities by the fourth century. So you had them in Alexandria, Antioch, Constantinople, Rome, and Jerusalem, because these are major centers, major cities. They're all equal. They're all equal. But what happens in, is that Rome, because it's the largest city, it has a certain stature to it. Uh, um, and then what happens, Constantine moves the capital to Constantinople, and there's a vacuum in Rome, and the one who fills that vacuum of leadership is the Roman bishop. By the end of the 6th century, there's only two patriarchal bishops, one in Rome, one in Constantinople. Still not down to one, there's two. And then you have Leo I, who calls himself Papa, and he becomes a very powerful political and spiritual leader in Rome, and he begins to think very highly of himself, and uh, says that there's an ap uh, apostolic succession, that Peter has primacy over the other bishops, and there's a successive uh, progression through the bishopric at Rome. And so that's, in a sense, you know, how the papacy kind of got started. But there's nothing in Scripture that would point to the, the one person having that kind of authority. So what's the, Ro the Presbyterian reform position? There are four general characteristics that we talk of when we speak about the, the Word of God. Uh, qualities, characteristics, the Scripture is authoritative. Uh, that means all the words of Scripture are God's words in such a way as to disbelieve or disobey any word of Scripture is to disbelieve or to disobey God. All Scripture is God breathed. It comes from God. The other characteristic is that Scripture is self-attested. So you, you can't appeal to any authority above Scripture to justify what it says, because then if you did, that would be a higher authority than God. So our confession teaches that while the Scripture um, is presented in such a way that it is... Um, I'm trying to remember all the, the in, in its majesty, and its harmony, and its unity. It talks about all these things, but ultimately he says that no one can be persuaded that it is the word of God unless the Holy Spirit testifies to your heart and persuades you. So someone can read the word of God and say, well, yeah, I appreciate a lot of uh, the historical evidence. I appreciate... Uh, the, the harmony, the beauty, and all this, but I don't believe. How, when do you hear the voice of God? When do you see the authority of God 
in Scripture. When the Holy Spirit enables you and persuades you inwardly, that's when you will recognize that it's the Word of God. <coughs> the other uh, characteristic is that Scripture is sufficient. It contains everything we need uh, from God for salvation, for trusting Him and obeying Him perfectly. We're not required to believe anything about God or His redemptive work outside of Scripture. And so, if it's if it's not in the Bible, or if it's not properly deduced from the Bible, you're not required to believe it. And that's why, uh, over history, a lot of Christians have gotten in trouble when they questioned authorities above them that would um, compel their conscience. That's one of the reasons that the Puritans left um, England and the Netherlands and came to America because they didn't want their conscience bound in terms of how they worshipped. They want to worship according to their conscience as they understand, understood the word of God. And then the other characteristic is that scripture is necessary because even though God reveals himself in creation, it's not sufficient for salvation. All creation says is there is a God He's great, he's sovereign, he made everything, and you're accountable to him, but how to get right with him? Nature doesn't tell you. God's word tells you. Now, there have been some modern challenges to this principle of sola scriptura in the Protestant church, particularly among Pentecostals, Charismatics, um, and what's called the third wave or neo-charismatics, and this is why I say that it's a challenge, because they all advocate that the gift of prophecy that was given to people in the apostolic age still continues, so that God can give someone a word to pronounce to others or to the congregation that is authoritative. So, you know, I go up to somebody and I say, God spoke to me. He revealed something to me. And you're, you're to marry, you know, Barbara. And what, really? I, I didn't hear that. He didn't say anything to me about that. Well, I'm telling you because I'm a prophet. Um, I know that sounds like a funny example, but things like that do happen. And... Um, there is a man by the name of Wayne Grudem, and I think he is a very sound guy for the most part, but he was part of the Vineyard Movement, close friend of John Wimber, and he has a very odd position. He says, the gift of prophecy continues, but it's fallible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's not on par with scripture, but it's still a word from God, but because it comes through someone, it's fallible. I have no idea why that would be uh, worth listening to if it's uh, fallible, um, but there are people who say such things that you should know. And then there's this whole subjective emphasis within evangelicalism, how you feel about things. <coughs> Did, did it move you? If it moved you, it must be true. If it didn't move you, then, uh, you know, the spirit is not moving in the church or something like that. There is a difference when you interpret scripture of exegesis and eisegesis. I'll just explain that in this. Ex is out of or from. So when we're interpreting the scriptures, we're, we're deriving the meaning from or out of the word of God. Eisegesis means into. That is projecting your, your own thoughts into the interpretation of scripture. And that happens all the time. People twist scripture in order to promote what they want or want you to uh, believe. Now, let me take a quick look at your outline because I think I might have uh, left something out of uh, my outline. I see, no, maybe I didn't. I don't know. Anyway, um, now, 
uh, questions so far just about what we've covered. What, what's, what's one application of your belief in Sola Scriptura? If you believe that Scripture alone is your authority, that this is where you hear the voice of God, how you understand God and His will for your life, what is one basic application? Read your Bible. Ah, yes. Read your Bible. Don't go to <laughs> Don't. Yes, don't. Um, uh, yeah, people, people look to all sorts of other things that are so, that have no basis. Of you know, they look at the astrology and all this to guide their life or whatever, uh, you know. The influencers on TikTok and YouTube, I mean, these are their, their uh, mentors and so forth. But um, if you believe that that's where God speaks, then of course you're going to prioritize that in your life. You want to take in the word of God, hear what God has to say. You live under his authority. He is the Lord Jesus, right? He is Lord. So, Lord over your life, how do you know what he wants of you and what he's given you? You find it in his word. So, uh, we could read other books. I have lots of books, and they're helpful in understanding the scripture and history and so forth, but that cannot replace the word of God, never can replace the word of God. Question. If we believe in sola scriptura, why have creeds and confessions? Because uh, we, we believe that scripture is clear. Oh, that's maybe another one. I, I, maybe I, I missed that. The perspicuity of scripture, the clarity of scripture, in terms of what is basic to salvation, scripture is clear enough that you could uh, come to an understanding of the basics of of the gospel, you don't need someone, you know, the, the church is certainly telling you uh, what it is, although the, God has given the church pastors and teachers for the building up of the body. That's one reason why we don't say the Bible, you know, I just find alone with my Bible, I don't need anything else, I don't need to go to church, I'm fine with me and the Lord. No, that's not how... God operates in his church. We need each other, and he's appointed some to, to, to teach and to pastor. But getting back to the question, if sola scriptura is true, why creeds and confessions? Okay, if you believe the Bible, what's it say? Oh, oh perfect. Perfect segue. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so when people say no creed but the Bible, it sounds very holy and spiritual, but as soon as you ask, what do you believe the Bible teaches? Unless they start from Genesis 1-1 and read through the whole Bible, what do they do? They offer you a summary in their, from their mind. That's what our mind does. We, we put things in categories, we summarize and things like this. So they say, well, the Bible teaches that there's one God and three persons and that uh, God the Son came down, he took on a human body, you know, they're going on and on. Well, that is a creed. Whether it's written or unwritten, that is a creed. Everybody has a creed, whether it's written or unwritten. So the only question is, would you, have, would you rather have something that's been carefully thought through, written down, refined, tested over time, or just your own, you know, whimsical interpretation of things as, you know, just as you feel at the moment. I, I rather have something that's tested and tried. So there, there is great value to creeds and confessions. Obviously, our confession, and we're going to say the Apostles' Creed this morning, we're going to recite it together from our faith. Now, the Apostles' Creed is pretty straightforward. People might have differences in how they interpret our con confession, um, but it's valuable because it, it provides a summary of what we believe the Bible teaches. And those things are very helpful 
not only in our own understanding, but to pass down the faith. I could, you know, give my Bible to my son and say, son, just read this and understand this and, and you'll be fine. Well, okay, Dad, I appreciate that, but it ha help me to have some, some structure, some categories, some hooks to hang things on so I, I have a better understanding of the, the flow of the Bible and the, the, the message of the Bible in terms of the creation and the fall and redemption, the new creation, that whole drama of redemption. How do I understand my place and what I'm supposed to do and so forth. So Roger Nicole was one of my professors at RTS. Great man. He was a Reformed Baptist, or you Baptist. Uh, and uh, he, he was so kind. He was a Swiss theologian. He had what a library he had. Oh my goodness. So after World War II, he um, went to all of these bookstores around Europe. I'm not sure how long after, but he found all these, these ancient texts you know, close to the time of the Reformation in vellum, they're like leather, they're this big, and he would buy them for hardly anything because people didn't know what to do with them. They just were passed around. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll give it to you for, you know, a couple dollars. And it's Calvin's Institute, like the second edition or something. So when he died, he donated his entire library to RTS. And uh, you, can, you can go there and uh, look at some of those books. But he has a very helpful thing about the value of creeds and confessions. Some people say, when you have a confession, it's divisive. Because you're excluding other people through this confession. And, and uh, Dr. Nicole and others were saying, no, 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 it, it, it's helpful in the following ways. It identifies the confessors. So to distinguish, preserve, disperse the attainments made in the knowledge of Christian truth. So who are we vis-a-vis uh, -vis other traditions? As I told you in the newsletter, out of the Reformation, there's four prominent traditions that arise. Lutheran, Anglican, um, Reformed, and Anabaptist, and we follow the Reformed tradition. And so there are distinctives to our faith that we say, this is, this is who we are, this is what we believe, and there's nothing wrong with that, making that uh, distinction to unify the confessors. So, to bring together and promote harmonious labor among people of diverse origins by providing a basis on which we can all agree. In Europe, so on the continent, um, in Great Britain, the Westminster Confession uh, was primary, but in Europe, you had the Heidelberg Catechism, and then you had the Belgic Confession. Actually, I think the Belgic Confession was first. Uh, and then you have the Synod of Dort. And when they met at the Synod of Dort, they, you have people coming from all over Europe, and some from Britain too, but mostly from the continent. And they agreed, okay, we, we all agree that this is what we adhere to, and this is our understanding of Scripture. So that served to unite them together. And that becomes a test then for people who become pastors who serve in the church to make sure that the correct teaching of the church continues. So I used to sit on the examining committee. I just rolled off because I've been doing it since 2002. And... Uh, it's, it's a long time <laughs> to, to be on the committee, but I enjoy the committee. But we are gatekeepers. And so men are coming for ordination, and it's our opportunity to make sure that they adhere to the confession. Because if they have some odd ideas, we don't want that uh, you know, thrown out to God's people and to mislead people. So it's, okay, so we're going to examine you on all these areas. And say, so, okay, yeah, pay for lunch and I'll pass you. No, yeah. that's not how it works. But we're, we're very careful about that. 
to discriminate the non-confessors. That is to differentiate and defend the truth from the perversion of heretics and false teachers coming from both within and outside the church, confessions set apart people and views at variance with sound doctrine as held within the body. So, uh, our confession will say that regeneration precedes faith. Because you can't believe if you're dead, and then you come across someone saying, well, if you only believe, you'll be born again. So, well, wait a second, that, that doesn't sync with what I've been taught. That doesn't match up with what our, our confession says. And again, the confession is only a summary of our faith, but it helps you to discern. It's a standard, a measurement by which to examine whether it belongs within uh, our, our body of beliefs or not. And then the other benefit of a confession is to instruct both the confessors and those who would be confessors, that is, to serve as the basis for the great work of instruction of God's people. The main purpose of catechism was to provide instruction for the young and those unacquainted with the beliefs of the church. So our um, shorter confession uh, catechism was actually for young people. The larger catechism it was for the adults. <laughs> Have you read the larger catechism? Oh my goodness! You know, one one question and answer. I mean, it's almost like a paragraph sometimes. Um, but uh, the smaller, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism is a great place to begin if you want to, to have, again, that, that information and structure in your mind of what we believe. And even kids, even if they memorize it and don't understand it, it will come in so useful later in life when they hear things because they'll remember the, that terminology and then over time they, they fully understand it and embrace it. But there, there are small kids who can give you a great definition of justification that most adults cannot give you. Why? Because they memorize the, the catechism. Do they fully understand the substance of that? Not necessarily, but in time, they will. And so it's a, it's a great uh, benefit uh, to uh, young people. I think, um, th of course, there is the, um, the children's catechism, which is an abbreviated version that uh, some of you have used uh, with your children and then you graduate to the shorter confession. But I, I find great use of the confession because of their clarity, uh, most usually brevity, when you consider how long you could talk about one doctrine, it's still just a page. Um, but the, the, the Westminster Confession in particular, you, this is a hundred years later af after the Reformation, People have thought through things, refined things, discussed things, there's nuances, and then you have the culmination of all of this together in the Westminster Confession, which in my opinion is, is really the, the best uh, summary there is. Oh, okay, we have three minutes. All right, um, by the way, our own confession teaches the unique, a unique authority of scripture. This is uh, from the confession itself belongs to synods and councils ministerially to determine controversies of faith, to set down rules and directions for the better governance of his church. It continues by saying, all synods and councils since the apostles' times, whether general or particular, may err, and many have erred. Therefore, they are not to be made the rule of faith and practice, but to be used as a help in both. It's not on par with Scripture. Uh, in fact, there have been times, even our confession, the American version, was modified. So the confession that you adhere to in America is different than the one that was originally developed in England. Because the one in England talked about the magistrate having the power to, um, to oversee councils and to... Uh, 
protect the church from heresy and to uh, deal with heretics and all of that. And um, the other thing that they, they removed in the American version was that the Pope was an antichrist. Because <laughs> they decided, well, we're not so sure about that. He's kind of like, like that, but I'm not sure if he is the Antichrist. Um, in any case, any questions about the, this subject? No? And of course, the men's group is studying the Western Confession of Faith. There you go. And what chapter are you on, Steve? You're on 24, I think, which is, which is marriage. Friday, and then the church. Okay. Well, it, that's always a, a rich study. Um, and thank you, Steve and, and Dennis, for, for leading that. Um, so, next time we meet, so a congregational meeting next week, and then we're going to talk about Reformed worship and talk a little bit about why we worship the way we do here at St. John's. Um, and so, that should, I think that will be very interesting. Uh, to you, uh, to just to go back and say, well, what does, most, see, most evangelicals do not believe that God has directives for worship. It's more of like, go there, love God, hear his word, and, you know, however the spirit moves you. But if God determines how he is to be worshipped, then you're obligated to honor that because we're, we're here for, for him to give him honor and worship. We don't tell him how he is to be worshipped and hope that he likes it. <laughs> he tells us how he wants to be worshipped, and that gives him the glory and uh, praise. So thank the Lord for our Bibles <coughs> and for all those who uh, who suffered uh, uh, and uh, experienced persecution to get our Bibles into English and into our hands. That's a great. Question. Yes? Um, Pastor Clay, it's the Meeting next Sunday only for members, or is everyone? Oh, invited? thank you so much, Julie. Um, yes, anybody can attend, and if you're not a member, I really would encourage you to attend so you can learn more about the church and uh, what what's coming up, what we're emphasizing, the different ministries of the church, how we're uh, storing our resources. So yes, everybody is invited. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and for this brief uh, survey of uh, Sola Scriptura. It's uh, really so essential to us, Lord, that we look to you and you alone for how we understand uh, our faith and practice. Ultimately, uh, you are the final authority. There are many helps that you have provided uh, through the history of the church, and we thank you for pastors and teachers in the church that you bless her with, but help us, Lord, to honor your word by reading it, hearing it, studying it, and loving it uh, because it reveals who you are, and that's the way we commune with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.